Now we will see some approaches from learning from unstructured data. The idea is that, you know, in classical neural networks, we, we are used to deal like with most of the machine learning approaches we, 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 we saw so far with uh, fixed size vectors. So basically we are assuming that the data is represented, are represented into a predefined number of variables, which are often specifically identified by some experts or some, some knowledge about the problem. And as such, you know, tabular data is really an example of structured data with a reason, reasonable number of known variables, uh, which are directly use, usable by neural networks like multilinear perception and other models like SVMs and such. When we are dealing with images, it's not the same, you know, uh, it's basically a matrix of numbers and each pixel in fact representing three real values, red, green, blue. So uh, as such, you know, yes, we can use it as the input of MLP, but the, the large number of variables, we're talking about million of pixels per images, is such that it will be very inefficient. So it's not the best way to use that. Uh, because every pixel has a little significance. You know, we, we don't, we cannot do much from every pixel. We do much more from, I would say, many pixels grouped together and organized in, what, in some local positions that is much more useful. So we cannot, we should not look at the variables individually. We should look at like the pixels as having some 2D structure when we are talking about images. So this high locality of pixel in the images make it suitable for using things like convolutions, which is an operator that take advantage of that locality that makes some efficient processing of, of images. Uh, text is another thing, is another story in the sense that we are dealing with a collection of words, which are forming sentences. And these sentences are of variable length and documents are made of many sentences, one to many. So, uh, all this is kind of a very variable size. And then and we need to kind of be able to extract from that useful information, knowing that in fact, even if we're looking this at the level of words, the vocabulary can be quite extensive. We are talking about 100,000 of words in French, for example, uh, and we need to take into account the synonyms, the homonyms, the related words that make it relatively complex to deal with. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's possible, but not simple and not efficient to deal with text uh, directly from the, the, the raw sentences, the raw, the raw elements making the documents. Uh, if we talk about, I would say, uh, pattern recognition, which is a field that is relatively, it, it's not just about images, but it's often about images. And, and it's kind of related to machine learning, but more, I would say, from the engineering point of view. Uh, the classic pattern recognition pipeline, which has been defined in the 19, 1970s like this, is that we have like four main steps. First, the segmentation, then the feature extraction, then the classification or regression, and finally, the decision making or combining of that. And the point is that each of these modules in the past were designed independently. It was, it is a good engineering approach when we have to manually design those. And so, you know, we develop some segmentation and this segmentation, yes, is used as input to the feature extraction, but, uh, you know, we can just do segmentation right and then assume that the following parts will be also correctly done. And likewise, we can define new feature extraction approaches, assuming that segmentation is doing well and classification decision are also doing well. And uh, the point is that with deep learning, we just stop doing this that way. We stop to make, I would say, a really modularized approach because it is a good engineering of like cutting our complex problem in smaller problems and dealing with each of these smaller problems independently. So this is good engineering, but for in terms of performance, in terms of what we can do, uh, deep learning allowed to just not making this design independently. We can learn all these models simultaneously, at least for the three first, segmentation, feature extraction, and classification. We can learn all this simultaneously. Decision-making combination depends on the context. Sometimes it is made in a more regular approach or can be also included in the process. And so the idea is that we are able to, to 
retrieve representation for segmentation or for feature extraction. So we can do some segmentation and feature extraction learning through deep learning. Uh, that is usable in general. It says that we are learning this for natural images of some size. Uh, once we, we, we learn this in, for a given task, we can assume that this is relatively good and usable for the task. And this is the case. Maybe we need some, some adaptation, some fine tuning of that, but usually the segmentation and feature extraction is relatively problem independent. Uh, it's more broadly speaking for a given input type of data that can be used for different tasks. And so that, that's kind of uh, uh, interesting. And the idea of representation learning is mostly to see that these two parts at least will be can be uh, learned from a big data set and then be reused for the rest, uh, similar task yeah, associated to the original task that we use from the big data set. Uh, also, when we are dealing with images, uh, convolution networks has been proposed for that, and they are really effective. You know, when we talk at the beginning, uh, on the few, in a slide at the beginning about having uh, uh, models that have the, the right a priori uh, versus the type of data we are processing. So yeah, with images, with spatial signal like sound and speech, convolution are kind of fit. This is really a good way to process that. And this, this is a classical way at also in signal processing. So uh, we, when we talk about the special signal, like images, not only, but like images, convolution is kind of effective. And the idea is that we can have filters. So we are convolving filters uh, on top of all or in special data. So, uh, and this can be stacked. We can have convolution that has been applied and this convolution will produce, if we have images as input, we will have images as output and then we can have many layers of convolution so we can filter with one, some, some, some type of convolution approaches on, with some specific filters, which output can be used as input for other convol convolution layers and so on. And the point is that each convolution produces a channel, uh, an output, which is, can be seen as a channel uh, input for the other layers. And as such, you know, uh, only with simple RGB images, we have four, three channels, R, G, and B. And, and this is transforming, like if we have uh, 32 filters in uh, the first layer, we'll get like uh, three times 32. Uh, we can see that. We, we can use different ways to combine this, but basically we get a a number of channels that is proportional to the number of filters that we are using. And the point is that these filters that are convolved are learned. So this is the element where we do learning. So we will learn the right filters by backpropagation. So basically, CNN is still a special case of the multilayer perceptron, but using special neurons. And what is trained by backpropagation is the filters, for example, of the of the convolve, uh, I would say the, the convolution we are applying. So we have several filters that we are con convoluting over the images, and this is what we learn. We also have pooling layers. So pooling layers is basically making, uh, combining and selecting values. So we can do things like using the max values over a range of, say, eight values, or we are using computing the average. So when you say like max pooling is maximum, average pooling is taking the average over a set of functions and that allows to reduce uh, the size of the values because if we just applying convolution layers over conversion layers, it tend to explode the number of outputs and it will be unsustainable. So we need to do convolution following by some pooling to kind of shrink back to a reasonable size the output of convolution layers. And in the end, usually like a, uh, the last or the few last layers are fully connected layers. So basically what we have with the multilayer perceptron, but uh, the input of these multilayer perceptron layers or fully connected layers are the output of the convolution and pooling layers that we have uh, from the, in the first part of the network. And this is used to basically make the decision, for example, to classify an image to the right uh, type of, object we find in it. So th this will be presented in details for 
the, the next module on, on architectures, deep net, network architectures. So uh, we will see this more in more details, but just a, a quick overview of that. It looks that way. You know, we have a convolution layer. So we say we have an image and then we apply some filters that are convolved over all the images. So we kind of see a small part of the image, but we are convolving over all the image. So it's kind of a sliding window that is will sweep all over the image and get us with some results of the resulting processing, which, which we are pulling. We kind of uh, reduce that in some ways and we reapply convolution. We are pulling again, convolving, pulling, and so on. And then we get into something that is more like a flat vector of some dimensionality and over which we apply fully connected layer or several layers, it depends, to make the decision over say five classes. So this is an example of like going from image to five classes uh, to identify what we have in our image. So, so the idea of CNN is that it should, and it's not, it's not necessarily explicitly guide for that, but what we understand of it and what we think it should do and make sense is that it extracts some, I would say, lower level features from the first layer. So basically from the raw image, it can up and have a really more local view of the image, of every part of the image, and tends to extract, I would say, uh, vertices, some, some edges, I would say, we find in the, in the image. So this kind of low level features that we are able to get. And as we go deeper in the network toward the output, we get with higher mid-level features and then higher level features. So we can see here, I would say more complex artifacts and we can even see some kind of hallucination. I see things like a, a bird here uh, and I see there is some kind of bug here. So these are kind of high level features that can be extracted uh, at the deeper layers in the network before having all this outputted to the train naval classifier that is making a decision from that. The point is that with convolutional network, we, we have a significant breakthrough, for example, for the image net large scale visual recognition challenge. So the idea is that this challenge was presented in computer vision conferences where we want to recognize objects in images and we have 1000 classes, so 1000 types of different images that we want to recognize. And we are looking at the top five. So basically we not necessarily want just to identify the right class over 1000, which is kind of complex. We want to identify possibly the top five types of objects, top five classes. And if in one of these five, uh, the, the prediction is right, we could say it is correctly identified. So in, in 2012, the group from Toronto uh, proposed an approach that was kind of based on the idea of training with GPUs, which was not totally novel, but not necessarily that much used so far, and demonstrated with the use of, of GPUs with a good, large convolutional network, large for that time, now it's much larger. It was able to achieve really great results, which was about more than 10% better, lower error, compared to other, I would say, computer vision classical approaches. These are like non-learning based computer vision approaches or maybe learning based, but with some engineering to that. So really the deep network approach was much better. The year after the, the, the best solutions were all coming from teams in deep learning, New York University, Amsterdam, Oxford, and so on. So to, 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 to keep improving from 15 to, to 11%, which is still a, good range of improvement. And the, the other, I would say the, the best non-deep approach for that uh, was uh, at 22%. So the improvement was small, while you see that deep learning is offering really great gains. And uh, the year after, you know, everything was about deep learning and we go from 11 to 6%. And then we know that with ResNet, we go up to 2.5%. So the, the, the increases were really great. And this competition is no more L because we consider it basically solve with deep networks. So that was a big breakthrough because it demonstrated that for images, these networks are really efficient, really, really great, uh, and allow us to get much better performance that more, I would say, manually engineered approaches. 
Then we also have the text processing approaches. Uh, and the, the point is to say, how oh, can we provide a document, which is a sequence of strings of uh, many, uh, I would say, sentences, which are themselves many words, which are themselves a variable number of letters. To an, so how, how can we process that in a neural network, which is main designed to have a fixed size value input? You know, we have a vector of fixed size real values it says we have, I would say, 1,000 inputs. That's it. We need to get everything to be packed into 1,000. And it's not necessarily easy to get a document in a shape that is usable for such model. The, the basic approach that was kind of relatively old and really a baseline, a starting point, is the bag of, word, of words model. So the idea is that we need to get some kind of dictionary where we will identify the most frequent or the most interesting words. So we need to define some, this dictionary. It doesn't have to be all the word of a usual English or French uh, dictionary. It can be just a set of words that are frequent in our documents or which are deemed to be useful for the task. And from that, we will calculate the frequency in a given document of each of these words. So if, if a word is appearing, I would say 12 times, it will get a value of 12. And if another word is not appearing at all, it will get a value of zero. So we are counting the number of times each word of the dictionary that we are using is there. And then we get, a, I would say, a fixed size real value networks. In fact, it's more a fixed size vector of integers because we are counting. And so we know that for like the word at index V, we have that number of words in the document. And this is used as input says to a SVM or a neural network to, to learn to classify documents according to the frequency of words in, in, in it. The trick is that this is not taking into account the order of the words. We can see many different sentence, sentences with the same word and they will not have the same meaning. We, we are not capturing that with the back of word model. We are just capturing the frequency of words, which is really partial view. We can do better than this by using things like the n-gram models. Uh, so instead of having dictionary of single words, we have dictionary of many words organized in some way. So we say we need these three words in that order, we are able to capture that with n-gram. So we will get a different dictionary of one or many words. We can even look to script grams where we are not looking to adjacent words, but possibly words that are spread away and maybe present uh, uh, appearing in the same sentence, uh, but not necessarily uh, one on the side of the other. So, so that allowed more fancy representation engineering uh, which can help in terms of performances. But still, we are not in a situation which is really great in terms of text processing. And now we can look at things like what we call word embedding. So word embedding is basically projecting a word, projecting words into a vector space to capture some semantic relations. So the, the words that are together in the vector space should be similar or should have some related meaning. An illustration of that is that, and, and this is really not necessarily what is happening. This is more like the way we see and we imagine the, uh, yeah. the space in which we are working on is that algebraic operations in this space will respect some semantic logic. And this is an example where we see that if we get, and that has been shown, but it's not necessarily clear it was arranged or not, that if we see we have this point here in 2D space, which is correspond to the concept of men, and if we just move that way in that direction, we can move from like the, the, the male representation of that word to the female representation, which is woman. So this operation is go from like the, the man to woman. And likewise, if we have the concept of king here, if we apply the same translation about the same in that space, we can go from the concept of king to the concept of queen. So we can see that this translation is really about gender sex of, of, of an idea, like going from the female, the male to the female representation and conversely. And then that shift is basically the shift from man to king and that is from woman to queen. So there is some meaning in that, that we expect to capture in what are meetings. However, we don't enforce that strictly. It's more like what we expect to learn from having this notion of one embedding. And as such, we are constructing word embeddings generally 
by some kind of unsupervised or self-supervised learning approach. Self-supervised is really to, to have some guides. Like we had with the Antoine Colors, we see it is unsupervised, but it is in fact more self-supervised because we are making use of back propagation in a supervised way, but the signal is not a label. It's really just the data itself or some element of the data that we want to, to use as guide to train our model. So... Uh, so, so for example, if we have a document, uh, the input of a neural networks for document classification can be like words and the surrounding words. So we say we, we are looking at one word as the focus and we want to look at its, its relation with the other words, other words around it as a way to guide the learning of an embedding. So so uh, so this is basic, the, the basic idea of for constructing this kind of, of, of embeddings. So we have things like the continuous bag of words where we say, okay, we, we are looking at all the words around a given word without it. And then we want to predict what will be the missing word. So you basically, like we have a sentence or a part of a sentence, we are kind of masking one word and we are looking at the other words around it. And we say, what is the word that is masked? And this is the task we are using to train an embedding with a neural network. And so we will present all the words around it with the same weights. It is making some kind of latent representation of these words. And then from these words, we want to predict what will be the corresponding original word. So basically, we kind of map everything into a space and we average this masking, this mapping, in fact. So we are averaging this mapping into something that is used then to predict what will be the missing word there. The opposite is the continuous escape gram where we say, okay, let's let's first map a given word into some space and then let's try to predict what are the words that are around it. So we will use one word, we will map it in some way, and then we want to, to, to predict all the around words before and after. So uh, we call this the continuous escape grams. These are two valid approaches. What we know is that the continuous back of word is, is faster to train and to be used and while the Keep gram is more accurate. And we have things like word to vec. So this is well known in text processing word to vec, where we will use continuous back of word or continuous skip grams to build such an embedding. And typically we are dealing with a multilayer perceptron with two hidden layers, with the embedding in a few hundred dimensions. So here this Z space is in a few hundred dimensions. And we are training such model over many documents, a big corpus of documents. And hopefully, you know, it will it will allow to represent many things and capture the order also of words, and from that we can just use it as a, a way to represent words and use that as input to a neural network to process sentences, documents.